Ah, good morning, everyone. Um, it's morning here for me. It's Tuesday morning. Uh, I've been up since four o'clock dealing with the fact that, you know, the midterm closed um, late last night or at 6 a.m. this morning, and Gaucho's face went down during part of the midterm, of course, while some people were, in fact, taking it. So I'm kind of trying to figure all that out, but don't worry, we're getting it all sorted out. It's all going to be fine. Uh, this is definitely going to go down as one of the most uh, memorable midterms in, in all my years of teaching. So, um, well, hmm, interesting. Okay, the true cost. So the true cost, I, I think it's, it's important to, to look at the issue of fashion. And by that, I mean the textile industry, really, for a number of reasons. Um, first, it is sort of ground zero, or it is where the so-called industrial revolution begins, right? So um, what, what, where does it start? What machinery, you know, uh, brings it about? It's, it's the machinery for manufacturing textiles. It's the power loom. And this is coming on the scene at the end of the 18th into the 19th century. People are very concerned about this, by the way. There are a whole group of people who were uh, weavers who made their living by it, who were sort of the or one of the first casualties of the Industrial Revolution because they were losing their jobs because the machines could were so successful. So they literally um, started breaking you know, breaking into the factory and breaking the machines. They were, they were called machine breakers or loom breakers or uh, more often Luddites. Anyhow, um, this issue has other components that we don't usually think of that the true cost draws attention to, especially. So in other words, if we just look at machinery, we forget that there are the industries that that feed the raw material into the machinery. And with the textile industry, it's it's an important one to look at because, of course, in the U.S., slavery is what did that. Slavery, the whole setup, I mean, yes, you know, it was producing food and all, but, but that wasn't what that industry was about. Slavery in the U.S. and the South was, of course, about cotton and cotton for the factories. And then there's the, the other end, you know, not... The, I mean, at first, there are major issues, of course, and as we'll see in the true cost with the people actually working in the factories. But the true cost, I thought, did a great job of drawing attention to this, this agricultural component that we don't usually think of, which is still alive and well today as a major problem. And then, you know, the reason we had Vance Packard is the, the other end of it, you know, so the mat raw material is an issue, the manufacturer is an issue, but then how do you sell it to, to people? In other words, you know, how do you convince people? to buy this additional production because, you know, the system worked fine for most of humanity, for most of human history, the people were able to make enough clothing for people to have. But now you're producing so much more. How do you um, convince people to, to buy it? And as a consequence, you know, this is, and this is, of course, also something dealt with in the true cost. So, you know, if you think about it, this is through and through a human issue. What I mean by that is um, the factories are not just machinery here, right? So if you buy some products like, ah, so if you go buy a pen, it is very likely that no human hand ever touched this pen um, to make it, that it was done entirely in a factory. And I think we, we have a notion of a factory as being this thing where it works like that. Well, with the textile industry, it doesn't work that way. Um, in fact, it reminds me of a story a few years ago. I was walking with my partner um, up State Street, and we were just walking, and um, she wanted to go into a little clothing boutique, and we went in, and she just happened to look at a uh, pair of jeans on the, um, the rack, and I think I drew attention to the cost of them, and I guess this was an earshot of a salesperson who came over and said, well, yes, they're, they are very expensive in hundreds of dollars, but you have to understand that these jeans were handmade. Um, so I didn't want to give the person a hard time. They're just trying to make a living. But um, all jeans are handmade. Almost all clothing that you buy is handmade in the sense that someone is sewing that, whether it's, you know, show, winds up in a, a boutique costing hundreds of dollars or whether it costs, you know, 10 or 20 dollars and you get it at a discount place or Target or something. It's all handmade. There are a few exceptions, like socks are actually made in machinery that can make them that way. Um, but for the most part, and and the, the 
underlying textiles are usually machine made and that was what the industrial revolution brought about these powered looms that can make the fabric and all but someone has to to sew that fabric into a garment and that's why this is an interesting and important issue to look at in particular because it brings into sharp relief the social justice issue here so we could have given the nature of this course just said well this is an environmental problem and um, there's actually another documentary out there um, called River Blue which focuses on the uh, textile industry in particular jeans um, as an environmental problem and it it's it's called that because uh, uh, there is an actual river where it's sort of a, a basis where a number of uh, gene manufacturers are in China and um, what happens is the rivers literally the river there literally flows blue because the um, the waste is put directly in the river we could have focused on this just as an environmental problem consumption but it's important to realize that there are human there's a human dimension to this that is inexorably interwoven in it. In the same way slavery was inexorably interwoven in the history of the US textile and in fact manufacturing industry, it is still a human justice issue on, on, in a variety of ways, right? So it's what's good about the true cost. It focused on you know, the actual production, I mean, the actual production of the uh, fab of the raw material. So that's why we were in India looking at the um, incredible plight of the farmers who do that. But then we're taken inside of the factories. And, you know, if you think factories are like, um, you know, what we saw in uh, before the flood where Elon Musk was showing his, you know, robot going ahead and assembling things. Uh, yeah, yeah. Most factories don't, don't have robots in them now. Most factories have people in them. And the conditions under which those people work are, you know, are frightening, as, as we saw. But then there's the, the, the third part of it, or one of the many parts of it, is the other end is consumers because so the produce people producing it the actual farmers they're they're getting hit horribly the people in the factories getting hit horribly and you know here we consumers are being convinced and from children up to buy a lot more stuff than we have so you know people work long and hard for their money it's hard-earned money and you know um, we're convinced to give it away to people for stuff that we absolutely don't need you know we're convinced to buy you know five, ten times more clothing every year than we actually need. And, you know, we have to work for that too. So, so everyone is being, you know, disadvantaged here. And of course, the people who are, you know, at the top making all this, um, you know, there are just a few people at this point in history who are, who are actually benefiting by this. Okay. And then, of course, there's the, the part of it that, that directly applies to the course. All this has horrific environmental implications. So growing all that cotton, a monocrop like that in a place like India or the United States where cotton is still grown, um, that's a problem. That land could be used, you know, that excess production could be used to grow crops to feed people. It could be you know, um, not in, you know, large monocultures, but in fact, you know, more sustainable ways. It's depleting the Earth's um, um, topsoil and resources. So if you look at, and we'll talk about it um, in my deep dive next week, you know, Project um, Drawdown, if you look at those 25 things that I asked you to, you'll find that over half of them involve land or land renewal. And in part, because agricultural product has been so tough and, and, and you know, harm to to land we are destroying our arable and growable land um, to produce far more than we need um, either in the form of like excess, produ excess production for things like cotton or as we're going to see next week with excess um, food that we're growing so it's a bizarre thing that you know in the, in the world there are uh, food insecurity is huge um, you know starving starvation level for 800 million people uh, we don't have enough food and yet we grow far far more food than we have. We grow enough food to feed everyone on the planet, plus an extra billion people. And that's just what we feed to cows.
to create beef. So we're, you know, using our land in all sorts of problematic ways environmentally. We didn't focus much here on it because I thought the social justice issue was more important. But then there's the all the production problems with factories and all the, um, you know, the waste and all that comes out of them, not the least of which being greenhouse gases, which are used to produce all of this, which is huge. Um, and then, of course, there's the consumer at the end who are, you know, we're, we're encouraged to fuel the whole thing, and yet we are a big um, part of the problem. So the last reason I, I focused on this as uh, on fashion, I mentioned this last time in my uh, deep dive on Vance Packard, the uh, wastemakers, was that <clears throat> this is also something that immediately hits home for people. So, you know, everybody buys clothes, uh, everybody eats. So that's why the film this week is on clothes, the film next week is on food. Um, you may not be thinking, as I mentioned in the last deep dive about buying a house right now and all the things involved in that. So I, I don't think that talking about something like that, even though it's very important, would have been that useful. I talked a little bit about cars. You know, I had that lecture on why electric cars are a problem if you run the numbers. Um, and we could have focused more on that. But I don't think most of you, as you know, students, um, some might, but I don't think most of you are thinking about cars. But you do think about fashion. You might think about fashion every day. You might be thinking about fashion multiple times a day. Even if you don't choose to, if you go online, you know, you're going to be encouraged to think about fashion. So I think it is interesting to think about. And um, it it is where it all began, too. And, and what I mean by that is not just how the Industrial Revolution started, but the notion of fashion, the notion that things would go in and out of fashion, really centers in that industry. So in other words, the Industrial Revolution begins in England and in the U.S. and, and elsewhere um, with textile manufacturer, which, you know, making clothing and all. Um, <clears throat> but then, you know, you have this problem. How do you sell far more clothes than you can ever, uh, than you can make, you know? And that's where one of the key techniques emerges, and that's fashion. That suddenly, you know, and, and Henry David Thoreau was well aware of this and disturbed by it, you know, 170 years ago, that, you know, you come up with the idea of having things go in and out of fashion, you know, so, you know, you have two seasons a year, and that way, even though clothes could not, you know, you would not wear out your clothes. And this, of course, would be disturbing to um, textile manufacturers. But that other kind of obsolescence that Vance Packard identified as obsolescence of desirability, you would then not desire your clothing anymore. You would desire new ones because of this endless seasonal thing that was going on. Things were going in and out of fashion. It arguably begins principally with the, uh, the textile industry and clothing. That's why we kind of call it all fashion. But as Vance Packard noted, by the 1950s, it had escaped into everything. So all manufacturers were presented with the same problem. Automobile manufacturers, which Packard draws attention to, how do you keep selling all these cars? You can make far more cars than people need. Uh, how do you get to the point where we are in the U.S. now, where you have, as I noted in the previous uh, lecture, more cars than we have drivers? Well, make them fashionable. So they go in and out of fashion, do it every, even in Packard time every two or three years so that someone has a car that's five years old is beginning to look old regardless of whether it is old maybe you've only drove it you know a thousand miles a year and it could be almost like new five years later but it looks old and that desirability with fashion you know is in everything now Vance Packard talks about it with you know appliances in your kitchen are fashionable um, pretty much I mean I think an effort is made to make things fashionable by marketers pretty much for anything that um, that you would not use up fast enough. So you don't have to worry about like short-lived things. People don't worry too much about making like, you know, your disposable razors fashionable because you use those pretty quickly, I guess. But if something can be held long enough and they want to keep selling it to you, then fashion is one, going to be one of the go-to things. So it's, it's important to think about fashion, not just in terms of the way we usually use it, you know, textiles, clothing, but fashion is, is a key um, technique used by marketers. And then fashion in, in both the immediate sense that we saw in, in the true cost and in that bigger sense is a huge part of the problem environmentally here. So again, you know, what are the solutions, wind turbine, solar? Yeah, that's all part of it. But we also have to rethink how fashion works, as bizarre as it may sound. Okay, let me jump into the comments because we had some wonderful comments this week. Oh, sorry. 
Um, let's see. First one here. Let me scroll down. Let me just stop at this one. This I thought was such an initially um, good line. In fact, this person has some really, some other entirely different and interesting things to say. Every single employer deserves a livable wage, trade union rights, pension, safe working conditions, and health care. <clears throat> That's absolutely right. And in many countries, they get all that employees do. So my go-to, you know, I, I have a couple go-to examples, uh, countries, um, and they're by no means even the best exemplars, but they're useful. Um, and so one will be Bangladesh because we see it in the true cost and I'll refer back to it because in terms of flooding and how they're experiencing the climate crisis, it's important. It's an interesting one to look at, unfortunately, because uh, they're hit very bad already. Um, and in terms of countries that have it better and are doing things correctly, um, those based on the Nordic model, um, I often look like a Denmark or so. So go back to, to this. Um, in Denmark, everyone has a livable wage. In fact, everyone just has to work, as I've mentioned before, and we'll go into detail later, just 30 hours a week. Trade unions, you absolutely can form trade unions. The government encourages it. Everyone in the country gets a pension. Everyone has safe working conditions as they, they make that a priority because, again, a strong government. And, of course, everyone gets health care. In the United States, even, none of this is true at the present time, arguably. Why? Well, livable wage, yeah, the minimum wage in the United States right now is $7.25 an hour. Do the math, that's $290 a week or about $15,000 a year. Yeah, you cannot live in the United States on $15,000 a year, let alone even think about, you know, a family and all. Um, this is why people have to do the same kind of thing we saw in Bangladesh and the U.S., you know, work multiple jobs and all. Um, trade unions. Trade unions were important in the United States, absolutely. And, you know, um, the the right to, to form trade unions and all, this was, was in part of the uh, the New Deal back in the 1930s. Yeah, uh, trade unions in the last 40 years have very famously fallen by the wayside in the U.S. You may not even know anyone who's in the union. Well, I take that back. You know your two TAs. Your TAs ha are in a union. Um, pension, yeah. People working uh, minimum wage jobs, for example, they don't get any benefits, right? Uh, and including a pension benefit. Um, that's not part of it. I mean, there is Social Security, but as far as an actual separate benefit, benefit paid by the company, which which some companies pay, but it is not guaranteed. Uh, safe working conditions since the 1970s in the U.S. we've had OSHA. Uh, OSHA is, uh, you know, it was a wonderful thing when it formed. It even goes back far longer. But I'm not going to go into a lot of details, and I don't want to politicize this whole uh, class. But if you look at the last four years during the Trump administration, um, you know, just go online and look what happened to OSHA. OSHA arguably is greatly diminished because of the Trump administration. And of course, we, you know, uh, we don't have health care um, guaranteed for everyone. I mean, Obamacare, yes, but as far as the kind of health care that um, people have in other countries, we, we don't even have here. So it's one of these central things that we don't think about. And, you know, it's, it's, we can look at something like Bangladesh and the true cost. That's absolutely right. But let's not even forget here at home in the U.S. Yeah, including the collapse of the Rana Plaza factory fires, so how greedy companies care. The less money these companies spend on infrastructure and employee benefits, the more profit is made for a small group of people. And that's absolutely right. Um, this was what I thought was so poignant about this. Uh, my mother, who immigrated to the U.S. two decades ago, has experienced working conditions, uh, experienced working in garment factories in both China and San Diego. She talked about the poor living conditions, not making enough to eat, the long hours, and the strict management. The treatment of garment workers makes me awfully angry. The poorest people in the world who face innumerable struggles and can't afford the necessities in life, food, shelter, child care, health care, support the selfish lifestyles for the rest of the world. And what makes it even worse is that most people don't even know where their clothes come. The problem is the American culture, and with American culture, it's a people who have insatiable desire for more and more and, uh, uh, and the need to meet unrealistically high standards. Instead of buying quality fair trade clothing for a higher cost that will last longer, Americans go toward purchasing cheap clothing that is made to be worn a few times and disposed of. Cheap clothes come from mother 
mothers who can't afford to care for their children and cotton farmers who face the health consequences from pesticides. For Americans who choose to spend their disposable income on clothing, how can we encourage them? This is really one of the big questions here. How can we encourage them to choose more sustainable options and to defy society's standards on fashion? How can we change culture fast enough to save the lives of garment workers and to save the earth from further damage? <sighs> yeah, I uh, could not have said that better myself, and certainly not more poignantly um, than this person relating the experiences of um, this person's mother actually working in factories, uh, garment factories in, uh, in China. Um, China had more garment factories, I think it's safe to say, um, a few decades ago, but China has gotten into more and more high-tech production. And as a consequence, that's why like, um, a lot of garment production has gone to places like uh, Bangladesh and Indonesia and all. Um, but this person also draws attention to the fact, and one of the reasons I, I wanted to emphasize her opening st uh, sentence here regarding, um, you know, people in the U uh, regarding that even people in the U.S. do not have those basic needs met, is that garment workers, especially here near us, I mean, not much in Santa Barbara, I don't, know, I don't imagine, but certainly in LA, in San Diego, not far, 100 miles, a little more from here, um, there are people working in extraordinarily bad circumstances, you know, some of them undocumented, and as a consequence, unfortunately, then all the more vulnerable and all the more likely to be exploited. And the because of, you know, everything that I just said, that minimum wage is so low, that you know, um, employers don't have to provide basic benefits like you know, pension or health care or things of that sort, you know. Um, it means that those conditions even here are pretty bad. It would be striking, I think, to do a documentary like The True Cost, but you know, I don't know what you would call it, The True Cost in, of, in America of the fashion industry, because it's not, you know, it's, it's, it's not so bad here, I would argue, insofar as like um, the unified building code that we have, which is still pretty strictly enforced even after the Trump administration, means that buildings aren't going to be collapsing like they did at Rana Plaza. But that doesn't mean that the conditions are not bad. And it doesn't mean in terms of a livable wage that people are much better off. And what I mean by that is, yes, the economy works differently in the U.S. than like Bangladesh, and we have a lot more money in, in, in certain regards. All that may be true. But as a livable wage, what it takes people to 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 live in the world, since you know you 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 can't live on seven dollars and twenty five cents working a forty hour a week, um, it means that people have to work a lot more, and you have the same sort of problem that you have um, in Bangladesh, where the individual workers are are laboring you know, far more than they should, and economies can be set up so that this wouldn't happen, right? That's that's how you know. Um, Denmark is set up. This doesn't happen where people work just 30 hours a week. I, I realize I'm oversimplifying. I realize global economy works differently in production and all. But it is important to note that the protections and, you know, the social uh, safety nets are just not there in the way that they should, even in the U.S. and certainly not in a place like um, Bangladesh. And I, I, was, I was very grateful for this comment because uh, I thought it was a great way to start and also kind of brings it home. You know, we can just look at something like the true cost and the spectacle of it, but this is a reality for people, for, for even people's parents in this class, which is pretty, it's a pretty sobering thought. Okay. Ah. Um, this person argues that, you know, uh, made her aware that, you know, the impact just one person can, made this person aware that can happen on, uh, um, have, the impact that one person can have on uh, the climate crisis. Um, we can't contribute um, because it's such a widespread issue. So that's the idea, right? We think it's just so big. What can one person do? It just wasn't make, make any difference. You heard people make this argument, by the way, you know, the plane is going to take off anyhow. The problem is already there. It's not going to matter if I get in the plane. One person doesn't make a difference. Um, in terms of a plane that has one seat, yes, probably right. But the fact is, most planes have their all their seats full now. And the real point is, if if you and you know 199 other people did that, then that's one less plane that would have to fly, or however many people fit in a plane. Um, 
we just don't think about the reality of individually damaging the climate. Watching this film, I knew about the impact I make on the environment with the everyday choices I make. But seeing it was a whole different story. Yeah, um, another great comment here. So it's you know, people kind of like vaguely know about the fashion industry, but we kind of know what we don't want to know. You know, I think people have always known that, for example, the exploitation of children as factory labor and all. But it's one of those things that, you know, I'm sorry to have sort of forced it on you in the sense that um, not a, a pleasant way to, to watch something or Netflix has much better options in, in terms of being enjoyable, but I think important. Uh, this person, and again, this is, you know, underscoring yet again, what an interesting diverse course we have. Yeah, uh, my family is from India and I have visited there so often I've seen those horrific labor circumstances firsthand, making them far more impactful for me. India has a large population of overexerted laborers, though most of what they make is for export purposes. That, that's something, we're going to stop on that for a moment because there are a number of other great points here. But, you know, one thing to keep in mind when we look at countries like China and India and we look at, for example, their greenhouse gas emissions, I'll pop back on screen here, you know, you'll hear people say, well, China's emissions are going up. And I've said this before, but it's worth repeating. Um, yeah, but half of China's emissions come from making stuff for the rest of the world. They're, they're major manufacturing center. They arguably the manufacturing center on the planet now. So um, it's a huge part of that. And the issues that, that people have in India and China, in the case of India, all of it and any number of countries is that you know they are doing this for the rest of the world they are doing it so that we don't have to both in the sense of actually producing these things but we don't have, have the immediate fallout of them right so we don't have rivers running blue in the united states because of gene manufacturer all those environmental problems all those production problems we've we've sort of cast out and and much of the wealthy countries have to the rest of the world to to give them the problem of it all social justice problems yes but environmental ones as well um great point um I've experienced the low pay of this market because when I visit it became very evident how much cheaper things are in the US um um, one dollar is roughly equivalent to 72 rupees and a meal there costs 20 uh, on average. So a meal costs, you know, um, you know, just just like a quarter, a little more. It's, it's amazing. People there then are working far harder, makes it um, substantially less and a lot less in the, in the global scheme of things. Um, and remember, these people have to buy clothing, too, and of course, food, too, and everything else. Um, I know that this is not the only labor market to which this same effect, and and that's true. I mean, we the true cost doesn't mention India. I don't think in terms of manufacturing. You know, of course, we spend time on the cotton there and all, but this is you know everywhere, and you know personal decisions. Um, Though it may not give personal reasons, it does show the intensity of damage we do and how it impacts not only the climate, but several other people around the globe because of something we consider so casual, like fashion choices. Yeah, we just assume fashion choices are about us, about the look that we want or, or whatever, but we don't think about this issue. And by the way, it's, I mean, it's a complicated issue. We can say just, you know, buy less and go the minimalist route. But, you know, the fact that, you know, production is happening in these countries is you can see a, a road to becoming there. It's, it's kind of the same road that we took in the US and in England uh, and England and elsewhere of, you know, going to, from, a manu to a from a manufacturing base to something else. Um, but the unfortunateness, of course, is that, you know, no regard was made for those things that the, uh, the first comment made right off the bat, you know, that people would have pension and good working conditions and safe conditions and all that. That's the problem. And, and I'm not saying this is an easy issue because we would have to work globally here to enforce that. You know, those of us in the U.S., the U.S. would have to say, you know, we're not going to import things that weren't made under proper conditions. Uh, but we can kind of do that, right, by 
only buying clothes that are made under proper conditions where there's a living wage. The difficulty with that is, of course, and as we saw um, mentioned last time, or, or actually it gets mentioned this time, um, with the episode of Patriot Act, is that with greenwashing and all, you don't really know what those things mean. Companies can say that, but there isn't like a, an international standard for that. So that's an issue. But let's keep going since I haven't gone through many comments. Yeah. Um, person talks about personal experience going to like H&M Forever 21 ever since middle school. And as it says in the title, I didn't really know the true cost. Um, so we'll, let's pause on that for a moment. Uh, let me get my tea here in the morning. That's the title, right? A well-chosen title. <clears throat> you know, we think the cost of these things that you get in H&M and Forever 21 and everywhere really is that's the true cost so what's the how much did that you know how much did that shirt cost 10 bucks oh that was really cheap that is not the true cost of it though the true cost is not in terms of you know the dollar and cents that you paid for it but the cost to the people that made it the cost to the environment the cost to us in buying all this stuff that's the true cost and you know when people you know marketers push the true cost being that low number that you know that they flash whoops on the screen there um when you buy something that is not the true cost so i, I the, one of the reasons I thought this was a good comment I just wanted to put up because this person rightly really got to to what that title meant, and it's an important one. Uh, though I know people working in sweatshops are getting extremely low wages and working conditions are more difficult than here in America. The film's depiction of factory life in places like Cambodia and Indonesia truly shocked me. I had no idea workers would get beaten by staff members or treated so cruelly by police during riots and had such difficult, unsafe, long working hours. Um, let me pop back on screen. Yeah, I think one of the great things about the true cost, which arguably made it a very difficult thing to watch, was that it took us inside of the factories, uh, it took us to the, um, the fields where the cotton is grown. And we don't ever get that, right? And if you think about it, the way marketers work, they never want to tell you that. So, um, you know, we buy all these products. You know, when when do you ever remember an ad that showed you how something was made? Um, they obviously don't want to do that because if they actually showed you, you know, Forever 21 said, oh, look how the shirt is made and showed you, you know, a factory in in Bangladesh or wherever, you know, you'd be mortified. And and what's intriguing to me, just as kind of an aside, and I, I'm speaking here in part as an artisan, you know, I mentioned I, I spent a good bit of my life as a furniture maker. Um, I actually like watching artisans work. If you go onto the YouTube and all, you can see people make things. And I'm not talking about my own trade of being a, a woodworker, but, you know, if you see someone actually um, making a handmade garment and sewing it, if you see someone knitting, if you see someone weaving on a on a loom if you see someone a potter making something I, I find that all very fascinating and and I just kind of get mesmerized watching it um, because it's it's you know to see a, a true master artisan at work is is just the joy because this person you know spent a lifetime gaining this skill and and traditionally by the way you know like places like japan for example to get that status of master artisan you you, you literally took like 20 years but you know and you know it would be it's intriguing to think about having a objects where that would almost be the standard, you know what I mean? So instead of buying, you know, like a cheap plastic, you know, coffee cup or something that you would, you know, only buy things where you could actually see the person, you know, making that, you know, um, the piece of pottery on a loom and crafting it and mixing the glazes and firing it. And I mean, that would all be so interesting because it would also connect you up with the people that are doing it. But the system that we have is designed to sever that connection because you, we, you know marketers just don't want you to know about any of that or the the consequences of it or the environmentalness of it and I, you know 
pottery would be an interesting thing because, you know, there's some potters that dig their own clay, right? That that actually, in, in many places, you can just, you know, if you dig down, you, you get clay. Well, a lot of places you dig down, you get clay in the ground. Some of it is actually quite good. Um, it's kind of almost mind-boggling to think about something like that where, where one person would kind of do it all. So not only, you know, make the thing, but but get the, the raw materials for it, in some cases even for the glazes and all. Um, it's just an intriguing idea, and, and we have definitely been cut off from production, um, and, and, and um, you know, very deliberately so. Um, yeah, many of the images in the film will be ingrained in my mind for many in my mind for many years to come, if not forever. I I, I think that's I think that's absolutely right. Uh, from images of wounded protesters in Cambodia, contaminated river in India, babies sleeping next to their their loved ones, and I think in that case it was the baby's mother in a sweatshop, to the mountains of trash idly waiting for hundreds of years uh, to you know, to decompose. These are just a few. The true cost, you shocking images, devastating personal testimony is pleas for change, fair wage, and safe working conditions. Pleas for change, fair wage, and safe working conditions to convey the severity of the fast fashion the fast fashion has on people on the planet. So I asked you in the film uh, recap if we could, um, if we should be experimenting with new ways of conveying these harsh realities. And although I don't see why not, I also find the shock value, um, this method effective, at least for myself, though not everyone can digest sensitive and shocking information in the same way. Uh, so I do believe other methods of spreading awareness could also be effective. Um, <clears throat> it's just something I want to think about, um, in part because this is an English class, um, about the rhetoric we use and the technique we use for communicating. And the documentaries have been communicating to you in a certain way. The books that we've been reading and, and these people who make them think a lot about how to communicate this. Thoreau was thinking a lot about how to communicate to you. And certainly Vance Packard was. Vance Packard does such a good job because he's a journalist, a professor a professional communicator and, and um, some of the most notable environmentalists uh, um, people that you may know today are root communicators they start off people like Bill McKibben and Naomi Klein and Elizabeth Colbert well those three all started off as journalists working for the New Yorker but it is interesting to think about this and I don't and again this course I'm, I'm less interested in these things from an academic perspective than I am uh, in a personal way. In other words, if you feel strongly about this and you want people to know about this, how do you communicate it? How do you communicate it successfully? And with so many of these issues, people, because people vaguely know that the fashion industry is a problem, either from a social justice and or an environmental perspective, um, but people like shopping, you, they're not going to be very receptive to hearing that message. I mean, I have you as a captive audience so that, you know, I can force you to watch the documentaries and enforce it by giving you really specific quiz questions. But, you know, how, how do you go about doing it? Um, one thing is this person, you know, rightly draws, one way of doing it is this person rightly, you know, gets right to the heart of it here, um, used to just, you know, show it full force in all its horror. And as a consequence, you know, the way this person started their comment, as a consequence, this person will never forget some of these images, maybe. They're, they're going to just be ingrained because they're so strong. And as this person notes, that that works. Um, I, it's something to, to think about in a personal way, how that worked for you. And um, you can get a lot of that feedback, by the way, of reading through the comments, what, how it impacted people. And, and I think it's fair to say... Um, not because I decided to put it on the syllabus, but reading through the comments that people were were seriously and profoundly impacted by the film because of those sort of images. So I think that's one way to do it, although it can shut people off. And we're going to see a kind of twist with that coming up next week, was, which is Cowspiracy. In the film Cowspiracy, um, the, the filmmaker Kip Anderson, filmmaker and star, um, decided not to do something that, that almost all... So those sort of food system films have done, uh, all vegan ones in any event, which is to take you inside of an actual factory. 
where food is made. Um, and by the way, in the United States, and we'll talk about this because of gag, ag, they're called ag gag, which are agricultural gag laws. It's illegal to go into a factory and film that. It would be like saying, you know, if Bangladesh made a law that it would be illegal to go into a textile factory and film any of them. In other words, if you did that, you're going to go to prison. If you in the United States take a camera and go inside a meatpacking facility or a place where, you know, meats, cows are being slaughtered and all and take a film, you know, and put it up on YouTube. Um, yeah, you may go to prison for that. Pause on that for a moment. Isn't there a problem with that? <laughs> Shouldn't our laws be working and to favor us in a different way and not to favor industry, that particular industry? Just something to think about. But it is an interesting thing to think about how to communicate this. And let me jump to the next comment because there were a number of people commented on this and I thought very um, interestingly. So let me jump to the next one. Um, <clears throat> this person, um, and so the alternate film, of course, um, if you had already seen The True Cost in English 22, which is to watch The Ugly Truth of Fast Fashion, which is that episode from the series Patriot Act, which if I haven't mentioned it already, uh, let me give that uh, um, some, you know, uh, let me talk it up a little. It's a great series. And I think Patriot Act deals with an, a number of really important issues, some less so than others, but some really important, like this one. So um, it's a, as far as I know, it's a Netflix production, but I think immediately after getting made, they get put on YouTube so you can watch them for free. But you know, how does it work? Person notes here, it's humorous approach to deliver important information in a friendly format that was easy to receive and yet all the information was a giant slap in the face of just how horrible fast fashion really is. Even Hassan, this is the host, um, would joke about the actual ridiculousness of a society that has 52 fashion seasons per year. Um, he didn't take any of the, this didn't, however, take any of the seriousness away from the issue. In fact, just when viewers started to think that maybe this problem wasn't as bad as it seemed, he brought down some very undeniable statistics that really made the audience think. As a person who has trouble um, getting people to care about some of the things that I think are most important, I found uh, it was almost uh, revolutionary for me to watch this comedian get um, just about anyone to stop and pay attention to such an important issue like fast fashion. I do believe that more um, avenues beside documentaries, podcasts, and heartfelt video speeches should be explored in spreading awareness of these issues, especially ones that are entertaining. This way, an entirely new group of people could be exposed to problems and solutions they may never have seen before. Um, not because they don't care, but simply because they're not the kind of person to sit or listen um, or watch a lot of informational stuff on a topic they don't really care about. Knowledge alone may not exactly be power, but it's definitely a start. Um, that, I think, is a nod to the, uh, in the, one of the, I think the last generation, the climate and generation um, lectures that I did, I drew attention to the fact that knowledge isn't, you know, according, even though people like Francis Bacon have said it is power, but if you don't act upon it, it's not. But as this person rightly notes, knowledge is the first step. And I totally agree with that because if not, if you just decide to go off and do something half cocked and you're not knowledgeable about it, yeah, you know, more often than not, you might cause more problems. So knowledge is good, but then it goes back to the question that these last two comments have, have approached, which is how do you communicate that knowledge? Shocking images, yeah. But this person found it kind of like revolutionary, kind of an epiphany that you could express it in another way. And I think Patriot Act is, in my opinion, it's just an opinion, like one of the best. But, you know, other shows like John Oliver and all do this. And I don't know if I mentioned it before, and I think I mentioned it maybe to the honor section, but I heard, and I don't know if this is true, so I, you won't get a quiz on it, a uh, quiz question on it. But that the John Oliver show has two creative teams working on every episode. One are the people researching the actual problem. So if you haven't watched John Oliver, it's the same kind of thing, he, he, he tax issues. But you have a research team finding all the facts, figuring out what should be communicated. And then you have a separate team, which are the comic team, the comedians, and they figure out how to make it funny and how to deliver it. And that strikes me as so fascinating and, you know, yet another thing that you can do, right? So, um, you know, if you want to do something with the climate crisis, you could, you know, work on wind turbines and lithium battery technology, but you could also become a comedian or you could also more generally become a communicator because this is, you know, 
a, a really important point. I mean, I wish there were, you know, dozens of shows like this and that people really liked them. And and a show like this is so good because it is so good. It's so the production is done, the the host is very funny, and it's well thought out and carefully constructed. And I just think that's it's an interesting thing to think about. And even in communicating yourself, how to go about doing something like this. And and that's why um for example, when we get to Cowspiracy next week, you know, um, having been a vegan myself for for, for five years, um, I know that, you know, just jumping right in and talking about the horrors of meatpacking plants is probably not a good way to get people interested. There are other ways of going about it. And, and one, of course, is this class, because just to, you know, sort of pull away the curtain and showing what I'm doing behind the scenes. That's my challenge too, to communicate this to you. And this week, and which was so rewarding about reading these two comments, these two people, and, and many people, by the way, focused right in on, on the challenge of doing it and, and what I was up to in selecting these particular ones. But it is just something interesting to think about how to communicate issues like this even though, um, and, and it may not be directly, I guess, that's the point, you know, the direct way is the true cost to take you there. It may be entirely differently, right? So the minimalists, they're not talking about any of that. Minimalists aren't talking about the factories where stuff is made. I mean, maybe they, they talk about it briefly, but they're, they have another way of going about it, a very positive way of saying, you know, you may not be that happy. I never wondered why you're not that happy. It might be all the stuff that you have and your obsession with stuff that we're encouraged to have. If you got rid of that, I bet you'd be happier. So that has nothing to do with any of the things that we've been talking about, the growth of the so-called industrial revolution and all, all that. It's, it's a personal thing and it's, an, it's a more palatable message. But the, you know, the, the actual impact of it for the planet for people working in factories and all could be could be substantial. Um, and that could even go, by the way, to um, the kind of clothing that people are buying, because if people buy responsibly sourced clothing, then it's going to be made in factories that are, you know, um, have better working conditions, living wages, and all that's guaranteed. And it's further could be that environmentally things are more sustainable. Um, uh, just just given a side here, I have a, a friend, um, and I guess for reasons of, for, of argument, I, uh, I'll, I'll I'll use female program pronoun because it is a woman, but it could be just as well a man who because we're all interested in fashion one way or another, I guess. Um, but knowing everything that she knew about this issue, and she knew as much as you know about it. Uh, she um, decided that she wanted to do something different and decided that this wasn't good. And it's a question that so many people wrestled with in the comments. Well, what do you do? Here's one solution. I'm not saying it's the right one. And people have talked about it. And if we get, if I don't keep talking, we get down the rest of the comments, things like, um, you know, buying you know, thrifting and thrift flips and all. But what she did is she figured out exactly how much money she spent in the previous year, went through all her visa bills or whatever, figured out how much that was every month. And this was how much she spent for clothing and then decided to continue to spend exactly that much money, but not buying a ton of stuff, but by buying just responsibly made things. So buying far fewer of them, which meant she had to research how people, um, and there's a lot of this online, how people have smaller wardrobes and make it work. And, and telling me about it, I didn't realize that, for example, um, French fashion still functions this way. And it goes back more than 100 years where um, people will buy far fewer things, but they will buy things with the idea that they have a wardrobe where you can mix and match things and create new outfits every day out of a limit number of things. And this is why apparently like scarves are so big in certain places because you can completely change the look just by moving scarves around and all. I didn't know all this, but um, the idea here is that, you know, you can still be every bit as much into fashion, still spend as much on fashion, still buy things, but just buy far fewer of them. But as she noted, things that she liked ultimately more because instead of buying like a you know, $20 skirt or something, she 
bought one for 200 that that lasted longer she felt better about and, and felt a greater connection to I'm not saying that's a solution I'm certainly not trying to buy into the gendered thing saying only women can do that men could anyone could do that um, but it is something to think about that this is something that we can address personally although going back to that very first sentence of the first comment um, today you know we really need to think about a system change here. The system is broken. It is it is not serving the great majority of people, including us as consumers. And it's certainly not serving the people who are in the business of producing the stuff or making or, or getting the raw materials for the stuff that we're consuming. Okay. Jump to the next one. Yeah. So this is the story that I told about um, watching a young girl uh, being sold, uh, cos being pitched at by a cosmetic company. And the company, um, you know, didn't know, as this person notes, whether or not the, um, this child would actually buy their product, but, you know, um, that it did ensure that there were future customers. And, and, and I think the way it was set up so that there would be brand loyalty as well. Yep. Um, consumption is the goal, and if they get one more little girl to partake, they at least have a shot to convince her to buy from them later. Um, something like makeup, I think, is incredibly and horrifically interesting to study as, uh, uh, as it is good to be uh, as uh, good to be consumed, as it isn't just marketed to women and girls as something they should want, or as something that will somehow be useful to them, but rather as a necessary part of their identities. We're baited as young girls with the beautiful idea of womanhood, and how makeup will bring us there even sooner until it becomes a part of our identity. And without it, we are meant to feel ugly, unfinished, and less feminine. These are positively psychotic manipulation techniques that fundamentally change who we are as people. Also, that a small group of corporate leaders will make a flat, a fat paycheck. Ah. Another perfect comment. Um, so first off, um, both what I just did and with this, uh, there's a there's gendered, you know, advertising and gendered identity at work here, and advertisers are leveraging it all that they can. Um, they absolutely are, and um, in some ways, what I talked about, having watched a TV commercial, is is kind of quaint and old fashioned at this point. If you look at how it's targeted to young women and girls at this point, um, a lot of it is bizarrely young women and girls are being conscripted or used by these industries to do that so what do i mean you know young woman gets a youtube channel hopefully gets a lot of subscribers maybe hundreds of thousands maybe millions then she suddenly has the ability to monetize this okay people want to make a living and how do you monetize it well first stop or one of the first stops the cosmetic industry because they're very interested in what this you know person has to sell and what are they selling they're selling a million subscribers um, that you know that they can be reached so then what the you know the content will then be on the you know the influencers uh, website will be this person applying cosmetics showing how she got to be so beautiful and that these products are what did it and, you know, a young girl, eight years old, is watching this and, you know, taking it all in and thinking, that's what I want to be. And I guess that's how you get there. It's, 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 you know, it's, it's horrific. You know, the, the, and again, the comment, the person who the positively psychotic manipulation techniques, it is very unfortunate to think about. And again, one that we don't think about, and certainly the people that are being manipulated by it, don't think about it. And, um, it's useful and important to think about this as gendered, uh, as the way it works, but it's by no means just, you know, young girls and women, it's boys and men are, are also being targeted entirely different ways and it's also something you know in, in a larger picture to think about that our notions of gendered identity 
of what it is is this person right no, notes you know the idea the beautiful idea of womanhood um you know that's being constructed by advertisers so it's not like you're getting that if you're a young girl by looking at your mother or, you know or a boy looking at his father advertisers are taking over that business now and of constructing it and they're not doing it for any good reason necessarily right in other words you know what can we you know instill in people that would make for a better society that you know we should instill to everyone to be you know compassionate and 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 deal with everyone with loving kindness and all that that's not what's being sold here but it's also creating gendered binary identities here and you know in some ways it's buying into old-fashioned notions and and very again binary ways it doesn't have to be that way right it doesn't all have to be that way um it's it's you know it's in part because advertisers are making it that way they could step outside of that and they could say well you know all this makeup thing and all this is not you know uh, integral to either being a woman or a human being and and they could go about it very differently i think but the interesting thing to think about here i guess the takeaway from this comment is the reins of culture in other words who's steering this thing who's driving it who's creating these identities it's it's no longer in the places that you may think. It's not in faith-based organizations like religion necessarily. It's not in family like individuals. It's not in the government necessarily. You know. Who's doing all this at this point as advertisers? And again, as a justice issue, that's, that's impacting everyone, but especially the people that are winding up having to produce all this stuff. So it's, it's just a, it's a bewilderingly complicated. And, and as this person notes, you know, positively disturbing thing. Go to the next. Uh, yeah, person um, noted about horrific factory working conditions in a world history class. And Rana Plaza, of course, just happened a few years ago. In the spring of, two, of 1911, a fire broke out at the Triangle Shirtwaist Company, one of the largest garment factories on the east side of Manhattan. 146 Jewish and Italian young women working there were trapped inside on the ninth floor of the building. All 146 burned to death, asphyxiated, or jumped to their deaths. The sad truth is the fashion industry hasn't really changed since the Industrial Revolution. There have been so many deaths that have occurred inside these factories and nothing happens to correct them. The fast fashion industry still exists and people are still dying because of the exploitation of this industry. It's inhumane, unjust, and destroys the planet. Yeah, so um, the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory, many of you may have heard of this. Uh, as this person rightly notes, um, similar to Rana Plaza, but as this person also notes, one of many, many in the history of the so-called Industrial Revolution. And those are just the horrific ones, right? Those are like the 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 extraordinary in, in things you know it doesn't happen every day but the day-to-day -day of what happens in those factories does it's interesting um triangle waistcoat factory when that happened people were so you know aghast by it that's in 1911 it was part of a time that that people wanted the government to intervene that business was running amok and was out of control and within a couple decades you know we have the original new deal coming on the scene and it begins addressing all this it was, these things were addressed right after even the triangle waistcoat factory waist um, um shirt uh, shirt waist factory um even when that went up there were there were uh, calls to make changes and, and safety of factories and all that. But at the time, there there really wasn't. That's why when you come out of this, the other end of it, after the Second World War and after the New Deal has been fully running and all, you have all sorts of legislation to to do that. And that would continue into the 1960s and 70s, where you know the safety of people was would become a, um, a priority in the U.S. But of course, in the last 40 years, it's it's become deprioritized let's put it that way but um but a great point to think about that this is all not new that this has been around for a while uh, yeah this person notes that living in south korea fashion is a great influence among all people determining a critical view of wealth appearance and general well-being 
Yeah, as it is in the U.S. Well, that's actually my point, but let's, this is a, is a great comment. People in Korea take fashion seriously and regularly change their clothes according to trend, according uh, accurately portraying fast fashion. The documentary made me realize industry is harming so many people as it explores the um, life of low-wage workers in developing countries to its after effects such as river and soil pollution, pesticide contamination, disease, and death. The multiple interviews that are shown show the pain of people that result from wealthy people's consumption and the overall destruction of the environment that we are bringing upon ourselves. I believe that this documentary holds an important message that Koreans must understand before taking too much value of clothing. Um, terrific comment. Again, great that we have this um, incredible class. And that statement, the closing statement, I thought was so on with that person. I'm just going to read it again, but let's put it in the U.S. And uh, I believe that this documentary holds an important message that people in the U.S. must understand before taking too much value of clothing. Um, what this comment does, I think, is rightfully draw attention to the fact that you know, we call this the American way of life, and we are here in the U.S., at least most of you are, even if you're international students here, here at UCSB, even though during the pandemic you may still be home, not, not on uh, the UCSB campus, but still here. But it's important to realize that the wealthy countries on the planet are all taking part in this. It's the U.S., and we may be sort of the, the epicenter of the culture of, like, we, we, we set what's cool and people, you know, like what we have. There are other epicenters, right? I mean, Paris has always been one. Milan has always been one for the fashion industry. They set it, and, and people in the EU and, and in lots of places across the planet are involved in this. So it's not just the U.S. So I, I think it's, it's always good to, to think bigger than the, the U.S., both in terms of, you know, we're not the only wealthy country by a long shot, and countries like South Korea and all, they have, you know, their their own problems, big problems with consumerism. I don't mean to call out South Korea, just this person mentioned it, but all over the planet, these, their, these issues are happening. So it does draw attention to the fact that, you know, this is a global problem, right? And depending on where you are in it, whether you're in the producer, whether you're in the factory making this stuff, whether you're the consumer, you know, we're all intimately, you know, sort of woven together to use a, a, a textile image in all this. And, and, and that's one of the most um, difficult things, right? Because we can, you know, just say we shored up all the laws that we have in the U.S. that were a problem, going back to that very first sentence, um, uh, the first comment a person made. So if we have a decent minimum wage and everyone gets health care and all those things in the U.S., well, wouldn't that be terrific? But then what about all the stuff we buy? from all the countries that don't have any of that or the environmental standards for the manufacturer. How does that work? So it's, it's this comment just sort of pulls home the fact to me that this is a really an international thing. So let's do one last comment. Uh, watching the true cost was a weird experience. Um, this person, like many people, subconsciously knows it's horrible and devastating, but no one wants to address or recognize it. One thing that stood out to me when Ken said that we need to start rethinking the American dream, and I totally agree. I see just um, as a small proportion of the world holds the majority of wealth, so does influence and trend setting. It's a very good comment. I'm going to pause on that for a moment. Yeah. We in countries like the U.S. and South Korea and France and Italy and all sorts of places, we hold a lot of the world's wealth. But we also have, you know, because you can call that economic capital and, and people generally do, but there's something else that people refer to, and that's cultural capital. We have the cultural capital. In other words, people look to us and say, I want to be that. I want to do that. We are, you know, in terms of, you know, uh, internet, you know, um, uh, jargon, we're the influencers. We are the big influencers here. Uh, while it is true that many um, people have different ways of expressing themselves, there are a handful of influential people who masses of the population follow and want to be. If we started having these massively influential influencers uh, adopt more sustainable lifestyles that don't seem out of... Um, seem as much out of place on material things, 
the mass of people might follow. I do not know exactly how this would work because it's seen engraved in our American minds that wealth equals objects and objects equals status. Wonderful little uh, um, logical thing there, ratio, uh, two ratios. Um, I just wish that there was a way to gain as much popularity as a Hollywood A-list star and be known as sustainable. It's true if there were to be tons of stars preaching minimalism or simply living more plainly, there would be whole internet groups dedicated to pointing out their privilege and bashing their choice. Uh, well, that's the way the internet works. It's not a pleasant place. But, but still, uh, that might be true. But there would be a way to make um, less people, uh, uh, less feel like more to the average American. So having less would feel like more. <clears throat> it's a wonderful point and an important one and a, and a good one to close on. It's not all about wealth. You know, the U.S. and wealthy countries, that's why we're wealthy. We have a lot of wealth. But we're also the world influencers. And people look at us. We're the, uh, to use this person's phrase, you know, we're the Hollywood A-listers of the global population. So people look to what we do and want. In the same way, my example of, you know, young girls looking at, <clears throat> you know, a, a teenage influencers applying makeup. I mean, they're, they're looking to, you know, an ideal and an ideal that they desire. And unfortunately, one of the things that we export you know, we don't export a lot of manufacturing products now. The U.S. is the manufacturing hub that it was, say, in the 1950s. But we do export that, that image, you know, the American dream. We export that to the world. And I don't mean that it's something that we did back in the middle of the, of the 20th. But, I mean, in the 21st, you know, we do that. We are exporting that. And, and the interesting thing to think about this, and I've said it before, but I'll say it again in this context, in California especially, we export that. I mean, if you think about it, who are the big influencers like in the, in the U.S.? There are other places that are influencing things like, um, you know, like the Bay Area and Brooklyn and all. Yeah, sure. But California, the California lifestyle, the California flavor of the American lifestyle is exported to the world. And there's so many, as this person again called them, you know, Hollywood A-list stars, um, who only talk about what they have and how much they have and how many cars and flying around in private jets and having huge houses and everything and everything and everything. Wouldn't it be amazing if, if some of those people did something different. And, and that's why, you know, um, kudos to Leonardo DiCaprio for making um, uh, or being involved in the film, you know, before the flood. Because, you know, I, I don't know much about him. And uh, but I do know that of all the people in Hollywood, he's one who really, you know, um, jumped in on this issue. And there are others. Mark Ruffalo comes to mind and all. But um, one thing that, that always stuck in my mind from a film that you're going to watch at the end of the term, if you've had English 22, you may have already seen it. I may have actually mentioned this to the class in one of these uh, lectures, but I might have just done it to the honor section. I forget, so I'll do it again. In that film, and again, not to be a spoiler of it, but I think I did mention this to you, but I'll say it again. Um, there's a guy who was um, an A-lister in, in London and had a very um, prestigious, high-paying job in the financial sector. In other words, kind of like a Wall Street person for us. And instead of living that lifestyle, it's a pretty young guy, um, he instead went to India to work in Calcutta at a leper colony. Um, and he argues that, and you'll see him, that he is far happier doing that than being in his, you know, his high paying corporate finance job. It strikes me, you know, as a thought experiment, what if you know, Hollywood A-lister, big one, a number of them did things like that. You know, what if, you know, to call him out, what if Kanye West decided to, instead of, you know, going on and on about whatever he's going on and on about often, not picking on him, but um, what if he decided to do that? And, and, and then continued to be the presence that he is on social media, you know, live tweeting about his experience, talking about it, tell, explaining what the guy you're going to see explains about how his life has changed and enriched and how he completely misunderstood what life was about. Um, what if a range of people started doing that? What if, and that's an extreme example, but what if a range of people started 
reimagining the American way of life, reimagining the sort of pinnacle of the American way of life in contemporary Californian culture? What if that were begun to reimagine that? So we continued to be exporters of cultural capital of, of American culture, but we're exporting a new kind of culture that was more sustainable, more socially just, and made people happier. I don't know who's going to finance that. I don't know who's going to monetize your Instagram um, with that. I don't know who would. But on the other hand, by the time people get to the point where they are influencers that can make such a, a, a difference in the world, they've probably monetized quite a bit already. Maybe maybe they don't need to monetize anymore. They could give back at all. Okay, just a thought. Um, great comments, um, wonderful comments on uh, the true cost. And um, I hope it is something that you, you think about. Um, Fashion, to be honest, environmentally is not, you know, the biggest thing for sure. There are a lot of other things like having a car. You know, if you rethink your relationship to your car rather than your clothes, it'll have a bigger impact for sure by far. On the other hand, fashion is, it seems to me, one of these things that it's great because it gets you thinking about it on a day-to-day -day way level and it gets you, it offers up the opportunity to make changes that can, can sort of move you down a certain kind of path and, and it brings about a kind of an awareness that you just don't get otherwise. And the other thing you'll get you, that can do that is, as I've noted, our relationship with food, which will be what we do, what we do next week. Okay, so uh, I hope you have a good week. Uh, take care and um, I'll be back then.